Canada's first Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald, was renowned for his resilience and capacity for optimism under the bleakest of circumstances. He had a hold on Canadians that few of our fearless leaders have matched, and he has a hold on one of Canada's best political writers, Richard Gwynne, who has done full justice to the life and times of Sir John A. in his second biography called Nation Maker. The first one called The Man Who Made Us was a national bestseller. I suspect this one will be too. It is my pleasure to welcome political columnist Richard Gwynne to Studio 4 to tell us more. Fanny, thank you very much indeed. I'm delighted to be here. A pleasure to meet you. I said Sir John A. Macdonald uh, had a hold on you. Yeah. When did that begin? Well, that's more than seven years ago, about seven and a half years ago, I started the project with not a clue that it would be of the scale that it was. And I, was, I had no idea there would not be two volumes and so on. And because so much happened, uh, McDonald did so many things. I mean, like he invented the Northwest Mounted Police, mm -hmm. which was the first distinctively Canadian institution. The first time Canadians could, when asked what the hell was a Canadian, it was very hard to tell who we were back in the 19th century, they could say, well, we are the Northwest Mounted Police, which brought peace, order, and good government to the West, as you know full well. Uh, but he invented that out of nothing. So I, I, there's far more to him than I started out knowing. Uh, I was pretty, pretty innocent when I began. And the Canada was pretty innocent. The Canada he lorded over, if that's the <laughs> right word. Uh, uh, you write uh, early in the book that uh, in Toronto, uh, the headline read something like, Lost uh, a Roan Cow, Last Seen on Queen Street East. Yes, I know. No, no. I mean, Toronto was a small, run runty little city, and Canada was a runty, backward province, uh, mm -hmm. far poorer than the United States, far less developed, far less dynamism, all that in the United States. And if you want to know how tough it was for McDonald to build a country out of this country, go to July 1, 67, as everybody knows, we become Confederation. That fall, first ever federal election, provincial elections across the country, almost simultaneously. And in Nova Scotia, which was the one important province that joined, the Navy had the Royal, uh, its um, West Atlantic Squadron uh, in base in Halifax and so on, um, 55 seats, federal or provincial. 52 are won by anti-Confederates committed to taking Nova Scotia out of the Confederation that ended three months earlier. And you wonder why McDonald didn't say, out oh, of hell with it. This is a mm. joke. This is not a country. But he was bound and determined, and he did it. And he was bound and determined that Canada would not become American and that we would develop into a real country. And we started, thanks to him, and we owe him the fact that you and I are Canadian. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are, and I'm half and half, as you know. But uh, and the better half is on my, the side. My original people, <laughs> those Americans, they like to annex things. Yes, I they know. like to take things. Mm. And uh, certainly in 1867 and, and on and before, mm. they were trying to get Canada, weren't they? Of course they were, and the Americans had this belief in manifest destiny. They very understandable mm. because they extended their way. The, the United States, which started, as you well know, a sm quite a small area, all the way to the West. That was a fantastic achievement by the United States. So why not go the hell all the way north mm -hmm. to, the, to the pole? And there was a real sense of that that was what God intended for Americans to be. And two things stopped them. One was the extraordinary and bizarre almost determination of a great many Canadians not to become American. And that is bizarre. They were fools to do that because if we all became American then, we would have got better jobs, more incomes, more developed, mm -hmm. better education system, everything. But they still didn't want it. The other was John A who, I, as you know, I say in the book, I argue in the book, was an extraordinarily brilliant politician. We don't yet really understand how skilled he was. He was in a class by himself, not just in Canada, but anywhere in the democratic world, he would have stood out for his adroitness, his guile, his deviousness, which is what politics is mostly mm -hmm. about. Of course, <laughs> and a little bit because of his drinking, but just yeah. a little bit. Well, that the drinking part, which is the one thing all Canadians know about John, <laughs> right. uh, they don't know, for instance, that he stopped drinking. Everybody mm -hmm. knows he drank, but they didn't really stop drinking. Uh, but his drinking, of course, helped him relate to ordinary Canadians and Canadians to him. Because everybody drank, or they, either you were temperance and not a drop crossed your right. lips because you go straight to hell, or you got drunk. Uh, and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, in a reception at Government House, Rideau Hall, Governor General's residence, gets blind drunk. I mean, that was the kind of place mm -hmm. we were. 
Ah, oh, the good old days. Yes, those are the real <laughs> days. We're now a bit, mm -hmm. we're nicer, but we're a bit wimpier. <laughs> a little bit. Who opened the door to politics? Politics for him, for John A. Mm -hmm. He was a lawyer. Sure. Well, he uh, he, became, he was a lawyer, and he went into politics in the way many lawyers do, did then and do today. Learn how government works, then go back and mm -hmm. then make a lot of money uh, representing your clients to government. And that was his motive at the start. And then he discovered, this is the 1840s, about 20 years before Confederation, that he was very good at it, that he mm -hmm. liked it, he, that he understood it. I mean, he was a people person. And if he met you, he'd start to say, well, what, what, what is, motivates this woman? How can I get a, push her that direction? How can I seduce her into the Conservative Party? That's why he would have seduced you, by the way. I hate to tell you this. <laughs> <laughs> he would be to turn you into Conservative. Mm -hmm. But that's the way he understood people. He liked people, and they liked him. And the Conservative Party, then and now, much different. Much I'm different. assuming. Much and the different. country, much different, except in Aboriginal affairs. Apparently, everything John A. did still uh, resonates. But Absolutely. we still have a little to do in the uh, Aboriginal Affairs Department. We have a huge amount to do, a huge amount to do. And actually, by the way, just on that, what disheartens me the most, I mean, we all know that our great failure as a society is Aboriginal Affairs. Mm -hmm. And we're ashamed of it, we feel guilty and so on, we don't know what to do. In the 19th century, there was no doubt that Canadian handling of Aboriginal Affairs was far better than that of Americans. Basically. Americans killed a lot of Indians. We didn't kill any. They allowed the liquor trade and uh, to go out. We, we, the Northwest Mounted Police stamped it out. And in many ways, and Americans who criticized their own policies would cite Canada's example. Today, nobody would do that. And the reason they wouldn't do it is because on the basis of such statistics as I could get, and they're very curious, there are very few of them, American Indians are better off than Canadian Indians. That the, the, those awful statistics about family breakdown, about suicides, about mm -hmm. unemployment and so on, are better in the States than they are in Canada. That's well, how badly we've done. And the conditions on some of the reserves uh, in the United States are not nearly as bad. No, they're not. Absolutely as right. what's going on up here. But the, what is sad is 100 years ago we were better off, and Americans mm. admitted it and used this as a model. So back to Sir John A. Uh, a, a few scandals, always some good sure, oh scandals. Yeah. No, uh, no sex scandals. <laughs> no sex we, scandals. Canadians have never been good at sex scandals. But something, well, <laughs> let's see. We'll go back to your Trudeau book, but <laughs> not now. Um, uh, a Canadian Pacific Railroad. Yeah. Uh, uh, something he fumbled, sure. Sir John A. How so? He fumbled it, and uh, very rightly, he was thrown out. You know, he, he was defeated mm -hmm. and thrown out of office. He didn't, I mean, he did take money from a business that was the Canadian Pacific Railway, that the company, a man, Hugh Allen, as you know, who was going to get the franchise for this transcontinental railway, he took a huge amount of money from him for the Conservative Party, never for himself, but for the Conservative Party. He shouldn't have done that. He, that was a conflict of gross breach of conflict of interest rules. What he didn't do, were, which is what many Canadians at the time legitimately thought, was sell out to the Americans. Hugh Allen had done a secret pact with the Americans where he, Allen, who was a Canadian, of course. Right, and he was ruthless and he was rich. Very ruthless and very rich, which is usually combined. <laughs> but he, he said, so Hugh Allen, did a deal with American builders of a railway mm -hmm. that was going across just below the border, the, the North Pacific Railway, where he would be the front man. The Canadians you, know, you could rely on in the, in the front room. They would own the company in the back room. It was a terrible thing that Sir Hugh Allen did. He lied to everybody from McDonald to his own American partners to Canadian railwaymen and so on. And McDonald, once he understood this, did break it off and said, absolutely not, it will not be American owned. And, but he had taken money that he should not have taken. Mm. But uh, Sir Hugh Can't Allen sold out, uh, mm. McDonald sold out the, his American partners, sold out almost everybody, everybody every, every, pretty much. Just about everybody, mm -hmm. including George Etienne Cartier, you know, McDonald's number two, who was very powerful. He sold out everybody. He was a real, uh, you know, a real, about as nasty a person as mm. you can get. And the bleakest of but times. he was very, very rich. Very, very rich. Uh, the bleakest of times. Did Sir John I had ever uh, consider suicide or leaving politics or doing himself in? I don't think he ever. Uh, there was a rumor because he went on a yes. bl blind drunk when he was at Riviera de Louis. He had a summer cottage mm -hmm. and he disappeared for a few days. And there was r press reports 
that uh, he, he had committed, that press reports that it was said he was committing suicide. He never did. He just got blind drunk, mm. he, he did do. And he, it's not in his nature. He was, as you said, mm. he's incredibly resilient. And a British subject to his core. British subject to his core, but British subjects do commit suicide. <laughs> yes, true, <laughs> but it wouldn't be so nice, would it? <laughs> no, Lady MacDonald. Uh, the second, yeah. uh, uh, the second wife, yeah. right? She seemed formidable to me, or at least loved him absolutely. She spoke French; he didn't. Mm -hmm. she Tell was me a, about she, her. She was a very good wife, but she was kind of harsh and moralistic. You know, there was one of McDonald's cabinet ministers, a man who went on to become finance minister, who committed the appalling social act or gaffe, and it's so appalling I feel it distasteful to even mention it on your mm -hmm. show. But he agreed to marry a divorced woman. That's how shocking things were. Alas. As, uh, most appalling thing. So he was, she, Lady MacDonald, read him out of social Ottawa. He never got invited to any big event mm. because he'd be, be, be done such a disgraceful thing as marrying a divorced woman. What is MacDonald's answer? He quotes the maxim that beneath the belt there is no wisdom. I mean, that was MacDonald's <laughs> attitude. He, he didn't judge people, he mm -hmm. understood human frailties mm -hmm. and flaws and so on. <clears throat> but she did, she undoubtedly had a big part in helping him to control his drinking, to minimize his drinking. She gave him after all what he needed, which he, before her he'd been a widower and of course a bachelor, and he, she gave him a, a nice house, a, a well-run house, mm -hmm. warm meals at the right time, everything. And but for her, her I think, he wouldn't have lasted a decade. Okay, because she did try to slow him she down. Did, she, he wouldn't have lasted a decade. Which wasn't easy, I'm sure. Yeah, and if she, if she he had died after only a decade after Confederation, mm -hmm. which would be 1877, roughly, there would have been no CPR and no Transcontinental Railway. And if there was no Transcontinental Railway, all of this area would have wound up American and there would be no Canada. Mm -hmm. So I say she should be a mother of Confederation. Yes, uh, and maybe one day. Yes. But as you know, wasn't it Mrs. Pearson who said, yeah. uh, behind every successful man? <laughs> it's a surprised woman. A yeah, surprised a woman. Was, a I don't know that she was surprised. Uh, we'll come back with Richard Gwynn, uh, a second biography called Nation Maker Sir John A. MacDonald. <laughs> I'll say it. His Life, Our Times.